Dr. Ilyas is going to be taking us through. Hopefully you saw who your panelists are. And uh, we're going to ask the CME team to unmute Dr. Stoder, Fuller, and Woosley as uh, Dr. Ilyas takes us through the next session. Thanks, Doc. Yeah, I want to... I want to recognize our faculty for this next session. I may have switched over a little early. So we have Dr. Thoder um, from Temple University. We have uh, Dr. Fuller uh, from Cooper Rowan University. And we have uh, Dr. Kreiner Woosley from Einstein. Can everyone hear me okay? Is my audio all right? Give me a thumbs up if, if you're satisfied. Good. All right, well, thank you. Uh, we've got a great panel here to discuss elbow fractures. So I think it's a nice transition from supracondylars. You know, supracondylars are challenging. And I think that having these experts uh, show you kind of all the little nuances to it that surprised how, how difficult it is to, to treat these injuries and the nuances that, are, that are, are applicable. Similarly, with elbow fractures, there's a lot of nuances and there's a lot of uh, decision points um, that we have to make in terms of the management of these injuries. And, and what I want to do is try to get through three cases, at least two. And what I'm going to try to do is um, highlight some of these decision points. We're going to talk about uh, distal humerus, uh, proximal radius, and an elbow fracture dislocation. So no relevant disclosures for this discussion. So we're going to start here. Again, I'm going to use cases to kind of um, bring uh, to uh, bring forward some of the issues that we want to talk about. So here is a 67-year-old male, uh, retired, uh, fall on the Asher's hand from a height. He was on a on a five-foot-high ladder or step stool. Uh, presents with an injury to his non-dominant uh, limb. It's an isolated uh, injury. Um, uh, let's see here. So Kate, any initial uh, thoughts and anything you want to do further in the ER from the perspective of uh, imaging and, and, and reduction moves? What do you need here? What do you see? Um, well, I see an intraarticular displaced uh, comminuted fracture of the distal humerus. Um, also of note, the patient has pre-existing osteoarthritis of um, his elbow, and he is neurovascularly intact and his skin is closed on his exam, I assume? Yes. Okay. Um, so I would do, I would have my residents do a closed reduction, put him in a posterior well-padded splint, as well as get a CT scan of the elbow um, to look at all the articular surface pieces better. Yes, yeah, so I think some people might say we'll get a traction image. I don't think that's wrong. I think it's a little painful for a patient to get a traction image, but I think it would give you more detail. But I think today, like you said, Kate, I think a CT is helpful. Uh, one of the questions that always comes up is, is, do you need a CT or not? And my answer always to my house staff is, is the same. If the CT is going to help you with preoperative planning, with, with, uh, with better understanding the fracture morphology, morphology and how you're going to treat it, then I think that the CT is a value. And I think with distal humerus fractures, they can be quite valuable uh, in terms of better understanding uh, what to do with this so we know how to uh, you know, manage this, this injury. All right, so here's some CT cuts. Um, I know it's only a limited uh, cuts for you, but uh, Dr. Thoder, any thoughts on what you see here uh, with, the, with the few cuts I've given you? Yeah, well, you know, as, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, as was uh, evident on the x-ray, um, it's, it's almost, it's so low, it's almost below the bosom. And he had some degenerative changes. Um, I'm not sure these images change a whole lot, in, in my opinion. I might want to see the reconstruction. I use those a lot. It's kind of fun to look at them. And I think, it, what I was going to say, though, the traction thing is painful, but you do get information from it that you don't get from the CT scan that's at the same level where the pre-reduction was. You see a lot of pieces, you're not really sure how they fit together. But right. the 3D reconstruction is helpful. But this is, you know, the other question I have is how active is this guy at 67? I got to be careful what I call old. Uh, 67 is pretty young. Non-dominant arm. Uh, degenerative changes to begin with. With not a lot of bone stock distally. You know, right. There's some there's some things here that would make you think that the ORIF may not suit him well. But by the same token. He may not be a candidate for arthroplasty. Right, right. And that's some of the decision trees we're going to get. I think I do have some recons for you, Chief. Oh, uh, beautiful. So here you go. So 
Um, I mean, I think, you know, they, it, they look good and they get some more detail, but I think they're pretty consistent. I think we would agree that uh, we've got a, a pretty low uh, distal humerus fracture, very much intraarticular uh, with extensive articular comminution. And, and as Kate uh, said, uh, a pre, uh, pre-injury osteoarthritis in the elbow joint, which may or may not have been symptomatic um, pre-injury. Elbow arthritis is not always very symptomatic. Um, so uh, Dr. Fuller, are you available? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, there you are, David. So any thoughts? So Dr. Thoder started talking a little bit about treatment. So what are you going to advise this patient? Again, uh, 67, non-dominant, retired. Um, uh, I'm going to say a healthy 67, active 67. He was on his ladder, you know, cleaning out his gutters. So obviously an active person um, uh, in terms of uh, treatment options at this point, David. Yeah, I mean, the, the options on the table, obviously, are the elbow arthroplasty or the ORIF, and it's such a hard decision for elbow, wrist, shoulder. You know, you got to talk to the patient. I think Dr. Fodor was mentioning that. It's so critical to talk to the patient, and occasionally you have a patient that just says, I don't want an elbow arthroplasty when you tell them that they can't do any heavy lifting the rest of their life, and I think my bias over time is to do less and less arthroplasty. You know, you see a few complications, an infection, loosening. And you just think, I wish I had never done that. And so as my career has gone on, I think I've done less and less arthroplasty, even though arthroplasty in the short term is the low hanging fruit. You know, it's easier operation, it's the more predictable operation, but the concern is the long-term follow-up. So it, it goes to patient's expectations, life expectancy. I think there's almost no fracture that, that can't be put together with all the tools we have now with these distal plates, the smaller screws, the K-wires, Mm -hmm. calcium phosphate. So there's almost no fracture that you can't put together. And so it's a real discussion with the patient, life expectancy and expectations and the complication profile that you want to deal with. Agreed. Agreed. It is, it is, it is uh, a little bit, it is a tough decision. And I, I'm actually came, kind of in your camp, David, I've kind of shifted more and more annually to, to fix anything and can because arthroplasty can be complicated. And when they start to have complications or failures or challenging, Kate, how would you, how would you make, how would you lay out this for the patient? Um, you know, ORI versus arthroplasty, how would you tell them the pros and cons? Um, well, the main con for, for the total elbow is, you know, and talking about you can't do any heavy lifting, I try and put it in terms of their everyday activities if they're not working. So you can't lift more than five pounds for the rest of your life. If you want to go to Costco and get a case of water or a case of soda, you can't pick that up with both your hands. If you're just doing laundry around the house, a heavy laundry bag, you're not going to be able to pick that up with your hands. So I try and put it in terms of activity specific to their everyday life. And when I talk about those types of things, like not picking up laundry or not picking up a case of water, that really turns them off from the idea of the total elbow. Um, yeah. And talking about doing an ORIF with the risks of, okay, you may not heal, you may heal in a malunion, um, you know, no matter what, your elbow is going to get stiff. But for this guy, he probably had some abnormal range of motion and stiffness to begin with. Yes, he is going to get more stiff, but, you know, talking to him about, we want to make you functional, touch your mouth, touch your butt, that's our ultimate goal. Um, I think those are important conversations to have. Yeah, I think that's really good. I, I like how you said, uh, identifying some kind of daily specific functional examples of what they can or can't do. And the other thing with ORF, you can always go to an orthoplasty later uh, if it fails or it becomes problematic. So um, we talked about basically arthroplasty versus ORIF uh, pros and cons. Arthroplasty has limitations and revision rates, and uh, but it's an easier surgery and easier recovery on the front end. ORF is a harder surgery, harder recovery on the front end, but on the long term end, if it does well, then there's really no restrictions in terms of their activities, and they should have close to same um, you know long term outcomes as as uh, pre injury. So uh, these are our options. And so let's say uh, we are going to do an, uh, just, um, we're going to do an ORIF. So uh, uh, Dr. Thoder, um, you know, you've scheduled this, the residents have put on your schedule. Uh, what, are, what are you telling them in terms of uh, uh, patient positioning, just really just high level positioning, what's your preferred approach and, and triceps and ulnar nerve management? All right, so I would do this in a lateral position so that the 
gravity uh, for the forearm is my helper. I like the universal posterior incision. When they're this low and you need to see the joint, I feel much more comfortable doing an electron osteotomy so I can see the joint. Um, I think that the, the points that uh, Dave brought up in terms of that the, the toolbox we have now has so many other options in it, that if you can see all that, you can put all the little pieces together from a variety of toolboxes before you put the plate on. And I don't think you can appreciate that unless you're looking at it uh, directly. Ulnar nerve management, first thing I do after the incision is find the ulnar nerve, free it, put the pen rows around it, keep it out of the field, and then I don't transpose it. Do, do not, you said. Do not. Yeah, okay. Anything different, uh, David or Kate? Um, in, in this case, I would do the same as Dr. Thoder. Um, I also would not transpose the ulnar nerve, and during my dissection and procedure, I try to really prevent as much devascularization of the ulnar nerve as possible to try and prevent a post-op neuropraxia. Okay. All right, great. And then, so a couple things just to add to that. David, did you, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? Well, it, it's an important discussion, the ulnar nerve. I, I always transpose it for intraoperative access. I don't know how to get the hardware distally and around the medial epicondyle for such a low injury without doing that. So routinely, I transpose it intraoperatively for access. But then almost always postoperatively, it goes back where it started. Got it. Got it. I, I, the, what the, I wanted to highlight two things with these questions. One is, well, positioning, you can do these lateral uh, or you can even do it prone. I think lateral is just easier to do. But ultimately, you're trying to get to the back of the elbow and using the forearm uh, to assist in terms of the gravity effect. Uh, in terms of exposure, uh, I think the more distal uh, a fracture is, the more articular a fracture is, the more an osteotomy will be a value. And if it's supracondylar uh, or simple intraarticular, then that's when you can do a tricep sparing approach and create two windows and work back and forth. And um, it can be challenging. Uh, the nice thing is, is that the, the tricep sparing approach can be readily converted to an electron osteotomy. So you can always start if it's an in-between case where it might be a simple intraarticular uh, fracture and see if you can make it happen with just um, the, tri the, the paratricipital windows. And if you can, you can extend to an osteotomy, but you need to have a strategy for your osteotomy before you do it. You can play them, you can screw them, or you can use uh, tension banding. And whichever those you wanna employ, you wanna make sure you have that equipment. Um, I think they're all fine as long as they're well applied, but we do tend to see a lot of complications from molecular osteotomies. And I think part of that is that, um, you know, you're doing a long case, you're tired, and at the end, you're often just not paying as much attention to the osteotomy. Um, and you may, you may not have, been, have planned for it ahead of time. I use a very simple technique where I'll, I'll, I'll use a 6'5 uh, headless screw, and I'll, I'll put a guide wire down, I'll tap over the guide wire, and I'll measure that tap, and I go minus five from that. So that when I'm done, all I have to do is put, put the, the osteotomy down, put a guide wire over it and put the screw down. It only takes a few minutes versus doing plate fixation or tension banding. If you do do plate fixation, what something that helps is to apply the plate first and then take the plate off. And then similarly, you're just applying it afterwards. So it, it just requires some discussion and then and planning. And then lastly, regarding the ulnar nerve, uh, it's been studied more and more. We studied it when, when I was at Temple as well. And the takeaway is that um, ulnar nerve um, uh, dysfunction, I'll call it, or, or neuropathy or palsy is uh, common after distal humerus fracture. Depending on what you read, it's from zero to 90% in some series. Uh, ours came out at basically about 32%. But the bottom line is, is that irrespective of the management, whether you're neurolysis or you transpose it, you have to prepare the patient that there's a high level of ulnar nerve dysfunction and that could be a product of the initial trauma. It could be a problem, a product of the surgical intervention, or it could be the product of that prolonged flex posturing and that edema that the fracture creates. There's a lot of reasons for that, and we often can influence a positive effect, but we can, off, we can often influence a negative effect with our management. So you have to prepare the patient for that, and you have to keep a, a low threshold of suspicion uh, that the owner may become uh, injured or, or, or dysfunctional as you're recovering from this. So a, uh, uh, despite all of your recommendations, and a total elbow arthroplasty was performed on this patient. Uh, surgery went uneventfully. Uh, these are uh, first uh, or one month post-op images. Uh, uneventful surgery, uneventful post-op, of course, patient is moving the arm freely. 
um, not having much discomfort. The nice thing about these is, is that you can move them right away, it does not require much therapy, uh, et cetera. Patient comes in uh, for uh, a six month post op visit, and now you'll notice you get these radiographs. They're not having any pain, uh, but what you notice on the radiographs is um, some heterotopic bone formation, and there, there's been a, a, a decrease in the range of motion in the patient's uh, elbow. Again, they're not in pain, but they notice something is off and you notice something radiographically is off. Um, Dr. Fuller, you know, we can see the HO here. Before we get into the management of the HO, is there anything that you do from a prophylaxis point of view for these that you would recommend? Uh, no, no, nothing comes to mind. You know, it's um, for the elbow, I, I don't routinely prophylax them at all. I just let them move and the radiographs that you're showing are common, but you, you want ingrowth around the, the hook in the front. So to try any prophylaxis, then you know that that impedes that ingrowth. So while the prophylaxis may impede your HO, you may actually impede the healing that you want around that anterior flange. Yeah. So, you know, the, you know, we'll keep moving uh, on this topic here. I, I agree. You know, I, I'm still struggling to this day to understand who are, who are the right patients to prophylax or not. Um, you know, you can irradiate them 600 centigrade post-op, what they typically say within a week to a day of surgery, uh, or you can put them on an, an NSAID like Indesin for a period of time and prophylax with some Pepsid or H2 blockers or whatever GERD uh, preventer of your choice. Um, but it's still unclear to us and the literature still hasn't delineated to us what is, who are the right patients. Perhaps the only ones we know for some, with some certainty are those with associated head injuries um, or a past history of HO formation from other injuries. We otherwise don't know. Would you intervene, uh, Dr. Thoder, at this point? Patient's not having any pain, um, and um, these are the radiographs you found. There has been some decrease in the range of motion, but nothing that there, anyone's getting too excited about. I, I would not. As a matter of fact, sometimes this HO protects the implant a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, by, by preventing the excesses of the extremes of motion, there's less torque on it. Got it. And Sometimes it's sort of a safety valve that you almost like to see it. Good. Okay. So, um, so here we are, Kate. Uh, you, you see the patient again. Twelve months. HO is getting worse. Now they're noticing that the that the motion is bothering them. Yeah, your prior slide. I would, you know, I I, I wouldn't get crazy since he was pretty close to the functional motion of thirty to one thirty. But now, you know, sixty to ninety five. He only has a. 35 degree funk uh, arc. So I'm sure this is gonna limit him a good amount. Um, you can talk to him about taking him back for a secondary surgery of an capsular release HO excision. However, he would be at risk of destabilizing um, the implant and then leading to loosening of the implant, which I think is gonna be more disastrous than just having a stiff elbow. So I would talk to him about the risks and benefits of just observing him, keeping his elbow as is versus a secondary surgery. And I would try and steer him towards just living with the elbow as it is rather than doing, you know, a release and- Right, and I, I, think, that's, I, think, that's, I think that's great, Kate. Th these are difficult, you know, so like, like it's been said, some HO formation is, is to be anticipated and is common and even protective, but when you get to this point, it's more complicated. And then if you decide to treat this surgically, it's not a straightforward surgery, right? I mean, there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of excising the HO, protecting the ulnar nerve, protecting the extensor mechanism, protecting the hardware from loosening, so not uh, an easy uh, um, surgical intervention. But in this situation, I would say that one thing that is easier is that this patient will now will be prophylaxed with something for HO um, in light of their, their history of what's happened. From a timing perspective, the literature says three to six months or negative bone scan. I think at 12 months, I most would say it's pretty, pretty safe to proceed. Um, and this patient did ultimately undergo surgery with um, post-op post prophylaxis and luckily did not have recurrence of their HO. We, uh, because we have such limited time, I'm going to move relatively quickly. I want to get through some other uh, salient teaching points for elbow injuries. <clears throat> Here's case number two. Uh, this is a 50-year-old male laborer, falls from height, uh, dislocates the elbow. It's an isolated injury. Um, uh, Dr. Thoder, any, any thoughts on your initial... Uh, uh, assessment of these radiographs in front of you. There's uh, an oblique, an AP, and a lateral. 
you know, but I'd like to see a lateral reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have that for you, sir. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he's got, uh, whether he want to go right to calling it a triad, he's got a radial head. Intraarticular comminuted fracture, he's got an anterior dislocation. He's got some fluffy stuff in the front there on that lateral. I'm not sure where that came from. But, you know, get him as close to, as close to reduced as possible and discuss with him that he's going to need something done surgically to stabilize this. Right. So I think it's fair to say, I think we all agree this looks like a terrible triad. Elbows dislocated, radial head is fractured on the AP. We can see that. And on the lateral, we see a lot of fractured fragments. Could be radial head, could be coronoid. But I think it's safe to say that this is a terrible triad. So, Dr. Thoder, I think you would agree that we should get a reduction and re-image this patient, correct? Correct. Would you want a CT, sir? Probably not. Okay. I don't think a CT is necessary. I'm going to operate on them. I'm going to find what I need to find. I'm going to base some of my surgical decisions on right. the stability as I go through what I do. So, I don't think I need any more information to waste the CT scan on. Right. And I would say, I would say again, for those who don't do as many of these as say Dr. Thoder does, that if, when you're, if you're not sure in the beginning, I think CT provides data, but I think for someone experienced like Dr. Thoder, you know that you're gonna be either repairing or replacing the head or, or repairing the coronoid, and there's multiple ways to do that, which we'll talk about. But if you need to know, and, and for preoperative planning, it's not unreasonable to get that CT to, to figure that out. So Dr. Fuller, a um, little bit different uh, actor. I think there's no controversy with the prior case of the distal humerus to go posterior, posteriorly, do you uh, approach this injury of a terrible triad differently from a positioning and a surgical dissection, surgical approach, surgical incision perspective? Yes, I, I look at all these elbow injuries and kind of lump them into two camps. Either it's primarily a fracture problem or it's an instability problem. And to me, this is an instability case and it just happens to have some associated fractures with it. But the instability cases, I'll do supine, and I approach them from lateral and medial. So usually two incisions, lateral first. 90% of the problems are lateral, secondarily medial. And then with them supine, I can work across the front if I need to. Fracture cases, I'm going to do lateral. But this to me is an instability case with associated fractures that are really secondary to the instability. Okay. I think it's important. I, I like that distinction to recognize that some cases are fractures only and some are instability cases. And, and an elbow fracture dislocation by, its, by definition, there's gonna be instability. And one thing to realize with these cases, whatever you do in terms of management, you wanna restore a stable elbow because these, do, these are prone to instability. In terms of the treatment, uh, you know, this is a, uh, there's a number of ways to, to think about this. But one is, as Dr. Fuller said, think about where you wanna place your incision. You could do medial lateral or straight posterior. My bias is typically straight posterior. Um, in terms that it gives me access across the, uh, every aspect of the elbow um, and also helps uh, if I have to return or what have you. So that the universal posture I find to be uh, uh, very useful. How are you going to manage the radial head? If you're not sure, you need to have implants in the room for both repair and replace. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then in terms of coronoid, what's your strategy to fix the coronoid? And similarly, you can do suture repairs or screw, uh, screw repair or plate fixation if indicated. So again, make sure that you have the necessary equipment. And then the collaterals, uh, at least the lateral collateral need to be repaired. What's your strategy for repairing that? So we talked a little bit about the uh, approach. We can do a posterior incision or we can do dedicated lateral medial uh, incisions. In this case, a posterior incision was made um, and then a lateral flap was raised. And here you see a typical finding. Uh, Kate, what does it mean to you when you, when you do this uh, arthrotomy and you see the, the, the bare uh, lateral condyle? What does that represent it up to you? That shows me that there's an avulsion injury of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament off of the um, lateral of the condyle. And, and, and for the most part, that's almost always the case, right? So we know there's a lateral collateral ligament injury. Um, and in some ways, it helps your exposure, right? It makes it easier to get to everything. But it, it's important for us to recognize what that is representative of. We'll see the fracture radial head. Um, do you guys have a bias? Uh, Kate, I'll ask you first to repair versus replace. So in this case, I'm going to tell you there's probably uh, two main fragments and then one smaller fragment and, uh, and clear off the neck. 
Do you have a buy to fix versus replace and why? Yeah, I would, I would do a replacement of the radial head. I think it's technically much harder to do an ORIF, especially if there's three fragments or more. Um, so you said there are three, so I would definitely replace this. Yeah, so it is hard. It's a harder surgery and, and also a harder recovery, right, Kate? So you not only are rehabbing the, the overall elbow joint and the potential instability of it, but now you're protecting that radial head repair. If you do an arthroplasty, kind of takes that out of the equation. The, 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 the proximal radius is, out, is immediately stabilized, and we know there's good long-term data from radial head arthroplasty. So I think that's a reasonable strategy. Um, so no one would excise, correct? No. Correct. Yeah, great. So there's never really a role to excise here. That's only going to worsen your risk, your your uh, potential instability. So when we do this, it's not if you're planning to do an arthroplasty, it's good to do your your trial and broaching, and then put and then uh, don't implant just yet because we need to you know work on the coronoid. So um, I won't get into this a whole lot, but there's two there's different types of railhead implants. There's your spacer technique types um, and your press fit types, and there's pros and cons to both. My personal bias are the, are the spacer types, but I think that it's reasonable to do a press fit type. But I think the takeaway is that once you've done, you've decided to do an arthroplasty is to trial it and then implant later at the way out because the next thing you wanna do is, is deal with your coronoid and with the radial head out, it's much easier to access uh, the coronoid. So let's talk about that next. So here is your coronoid uh, with the radial head removed. And if you take a look at it, uh, obviously I'm showing you putting sutures through, but what are your thoughts generally Dr. Fuller, you know, in terms of coronoid management, do you have a, a bias one way or the other, pros and cons, any pearls with coronoid management? I don't think these small little chips confer a whole lot of stability when you're doing these. I think the majority of the stability is, is the radial head and the lateral collateral ligament that you're gonna reattach. Um, routinely, when I do repair these coronoid fragments, I try and capture a little bit of the anterior capsule so I can pull that down too to sort of tighten up the anterior tissues. And it's almost a benefit when you have to take the radial head out because you have better access to this. And I think I, I probably repair more than I need to, but part of it's just teaching too, so I can show residents how to repair it should they need to. Because in the ones that are super unstable, then I want to get every bit of soft tissue I can. And then I'll get the anterior capsule, replace the radial head, repair the LCL, and then assess stability. And then I may find myself on the medial side repairing the MCL too. So you know, repair everything that you can because you don't want to be left with instability at the end. I agree. I, I, I've, I've become more biased towards repairing all the coronoids, even if they're little flakes of bone, uh, because of both from a teaching perspective and also um, any kind of uh, stability that I can confer, I, I like to do that. And, um, you know, the, this is a great example of what we commonly see. This is probably a type one or, or one and a half uh, uh, coronoid. Uh, fracture, but a suture repair is, is is not a bad technique, and it takes a while to get the hang of it. The key is make, to make sure that if you're doing a suture technique, since so first of all, you do a suture, suture technique if you feel like you can't get internal fixation in it, um, is to make sure when you're doing this that you're not capturing too much anterior tissue. There's some bad things that lie in front of the anterior capsule of the elbow, so you don't want to take a fat bite. You want to just capture those pieces, and then you want to deliver them uh, through one or two bone tunnels. Uh, so here you can see that the, this is a two-five drill going across the ulna into the into the uh, base of the coronary fracture. You can do it with a single drill hole and then sew it over a button on the back of the ulna, or you could do it through two drill holes. Uh, you, here, there's a lasso, a Houston suture passer being used on the left image to pull the sutures through, and you can see with it pulled down, actually the coronoid um, can sit down quite nicely. Um, and realign and provide some stability either directly as an anterior buttress to the distal humerus or just to uh, tension the, the soft tissue capsule attachments uh, volarly as well. Um, and then on the way out, we're repairing, we put the radial head in, uh, we're repairing the collateral ligaments with some anchors. Um, note on the bottom right, the collateral ligament repair. Uh, it's not just about repairing the ligament where it lies, but you actually want to tension the lateral ulnar collateral ligament proximal and anterior. The, the analogy I give uh, my residents and fellows is that the, the collat ulnar collateral ligament, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is like a hammock for the radial head. So you want to pull it up. So you're actually working your radistal towards the ulna and back to tension that anteriorly. Then you close the capsule and then you assess your stability. If it's still unstable, then there's st we still have some options. Uh, we can go uh, to the 
um, needle side and then mobilize, uh, um, sorry, repair the, the MCL. So real moving quickly because we're short on time. This is a patient's first post-operative visit. It's actually a different patient, but similar problem. Um, and first post-op visit, uh, Dr. Thoder, uh, any concerns here? Well, lateral x lateral x-ray isn't uh, concentric. Yeah, so it looks like the uh, radial head is subluxed uh, posteriorly, despite looks like, again, this is a different case, uh, but that it's here to, just, to show a point that there's actually two anchors. You'll see two uh, anchors in the, the lateral condyle. So there was an effort made to repair that, um, but the elbow remains unstable. And uh, sometimes I'll hear like, well, just start treating non-op, it'll fall into place. Do you think Dr. Thoder, this is gonna reduce on its own later? No, I think the ones that reduce are on their own are the ones that look distracted. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are sublux do not. Right, right. And then just, you know, again, not being there, but just look at this thing. If you look at where those anchors are, the point that you mentioned about tensioning the lateral ulnar collateral ligament anteriorly, you know, it's on that ridge and the anchor looks a little posterior if that's a, if that's a true lateral. So it may have been a technical error of not pulling that up hard enough for that sling to actually capture it. Right. And then the other the other issue is sometimes when you when you're still what I was going to say before, and it's, it's maybe apropos for this now. Uh, you should document your uh, stability exam uh, pre op or a pre repair and post repair, and if it is. You know, at a point where it's close to something you would have accepted closed, you got to weigh whether more surgery makes this better with the risk of HO, or if you just protect them in a brace uh, to not let them reach that full extension until things tighten up. Yeah, and and this and this is hard to assess that stability is challenging uh, in terms of making sure that it is stable. And sometimes when we're doing these repairs. We have the patient even supine with the elbow over top like this, and the elbow is very stable in that position. So after we're done our repair, we need to actually bring them out of that position and then range the elbow under under stress to really get a an under gravity to really get a sense of that stability to make sure that it is indeed stable. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're, we may be fooling ourselves and then, and then revising this. And the revision uh, later is, is complicated sometimes if we can't get that that, that soft tissue tension just right. I'm I'm, get, I'm I'm interpreting from Dr. Rahman that we are out of time. Is that is that correct, sir?